Hello and welcome. This is the full recap of my F1 2024 simulation. If you want to see more details and see what actually happened during the Grand Prix, make sure to check out every part which you can find on my channel. Let's get into it. Uh, Drivers' Championship, starting off with the most important thing. Obviously, I'm going to get a uh, bit into more detail uh, later on in this, in this video. Uh, starting off with the Drive Championship after round 24, which was the Abu Dhabi Grand Prix, I didn't simulate any sort of race dropping out. I know Singapore is at risk, but I still went with it. And it was a crazy race as well. Anyways, Drivers' Championship, Max Verstappen, 431 points. There was there was just no competition ever since like race four. Max pretty much pretty much had it settled. Even though the domination wasn't as 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 strong as in 2023, for example, even though the Red Bull was uh, was very consistent and very strong on every single circuit, pretty much, uh, they only managed to win nine, well, nine races, uh, eight of them won by Max Verstappen and one by Sergio Perez. 16 podiums, uh, Red Bull was obviously the most consistent team and overall for the entire season, the fastest team, which helped, uh, helped them get so many podiums, uh, in this case, 23. 10 pole positions for Max Verstappen, so a weird number that Max is having more poles and wins. You would uh, expect to see this number reverse, but that's what happened in the simulation. 14 passes laps for Max Verstappen, which was mostly de determined by the speed of the driver during the races. Basically, I assume the race pace, and that was the most important factor for giving out the fastest lap. And yeah, Max Verstappen, 14 fastest laps. You, you get the, you get the idea of basically Max Verstappen being the fastest driver over the entire season. P two Charles Leclerc two hundred eighty seven points. It was an up and down season for Charles uh, with four victories, most of them coming to towards the late of the late end of the season, uh, where Ferrari became relatively strong, uh, matching Red Bull in some races. Obviously, um, the Ferrari car wasn't good on every single circuit, and uh, mostly. Uh, and their their chances there was also this very big issue with re reliability for both drivers and of course there's this factor of them doing a mistake once in a while and generally very bad luck uh just your average ferrari season but this time they got five victories instead of one which is an improvement seven podiums for charles eight podiums for Carl Sainz. so 15 podiums a good number a pretty decent season for ferrari overall uh four poles for charles as well uh, the second driver most poles. Uh, obviously, Charles is very good qualifying, so it's just, this makes sense. Four fastest laps for Charles as well, so good for him in the races. Seems like the Ferrari has improved in the race pace as well. Fernando Alonso, 268 points. Fernando had an incredible season, and at one point was pretty much the well, it was the last driver who was considered to be in the title fight with Max. But then Max just cruised into his fourth driver's championship. Three victories for Alonso. Uh, it was very, very impressive as well. Eight podiums. Alonso was was incredible this season. It was it was like last year, but the Aston Martin car was actually more consistent throughout the entire season. Wasn't as quick at certain moments. Uh, obviously, the highs of the Aston Martin 2023 were higher than this car, but uh, here the Aston didn't have that drop off in performance over the entire season, uh, unlike other team, for example. Eight podiums for Alonso, so we're good number there. Three poles, so Alonso getting those three pole positions as well. Two fastest laps for Alonso as well. Checo Perez in P4, 236 points. Uh, I would say this is a horrible season, obviously. Uh, it's by no means a good season, because he obviously finished far behind Max in most most scenarios, but the head to heads, as we'll see later, showed that Checo had some weekends where he could match Max and even beat him, uh, which is an, is an immediate improvement over last year where Perez was just unable to beat Max, uh, apart, of, apart from those first four races, which were kind of lucky for Max, to be fair. Seven podiums for Checo, most of them coming to the towards the late, late end of the season where Red Bull. And to the initiative, and uh, Red Bull was pretty much just winning every single race. Well, Max was winning every single race, apart from one towards the end of the season. Uh, Lando Norris, P5, 
had a very, very slow start of the season. Now 229 points. He was trailing Oscar Piastri after his first few races, and Oscar Piastri was actually leading the championship, which is an interesting thing. Uh, uh, three victories for Lando, uh, so he got a first victory. I forgot to mention, Alonso got it. This 33rd, so basically a lot of drivers won a race simulation. So the podiums for Norris, so this number there as well. Two poles outshined by his teammate there, three and one fastest lap for Orlando as well. Carl Sainz, P6, 222 points, uh, victory, eight podiums, two poles, and the fastest lap. Carl's didn't have a bad season, as we can see, his podium, podium number is eight, that's second best, basically behind Max. Wasn't a bad season. It was just very, very unlucky for Carlos. And I'm not saying he had a better season than Charles. It's just that these stats don't show everything. And Carlos was much closer to the Clark than, in my opinion, last season. Um, so, yeah. Carlos, oh, sorry. Oscar Piastri, 304 points, two victories, five points, three pole positions. Very good number there. And a fastest lap as well. Oscar had an amazing season, in my opinion. Unfortunately, had a drop off towards the end of the season where Lando took the initiative and was outperforming him. But that head to head, as we'll see later on, is just incredibly close still. And those drivers were very difficult to separate and was just pretty much which, which driver had the more bad luck. As, as a desi- at, the, at the start of the season, it was obviously Piastri who had an amazing start of the season and then Lando uh, took the initiative. Uh, during the middle part of the season. Uh, Lewis Hamilton, PA, looks horrible uh, to be PA as Lewis Hamilton. This is Lewis, our championship finish in the World Driver Championship, I'm pretty sure, in his career. Uh, still be this teammate by Singer Point. Uh, victory for Lewis, that was from Singapore, I'm pretty sure, and two podiums for him as well. Uh, it, was a, it wasn't the greatest season from Lewis, to be fair. He was outperformed by Russell at the, at the start of the season. Then when the car became worse over the entire season, just Russell stopped. I don't know, it was, it was very weird. It just kind of flipped and Hamilton was becoming the better driver. As we'll see in head to head, it's actually uh, relatively one-sided. Obviously, Russell, his seven podiums come from the early parts of the season where Russell was a contender for a driver championship at that point at least statistically, but Hamilton wasn't scoring pretty much no points at that point. And then when the middle part of the season came, uh, Mercedes kind of became slower, and Hamilton started to be more consistent and quicker generally than Russell, with Russell doing a lot of mistakes uh, as well. Last roll, 129 points and two podiums. More, two more podiums than last year, but as I said earlier, the Astons was a generally better card than last year. Uh, just strolled 129 points, having less than twice, well, well less than half the, the amount of points Alonso scored, for example. Uh, just not a good season from Stroll, even though it was, uh, it was comparable to last season, if not better, but still the, the gap is just insanely huge. And I'm afraid this, it's kind of cost Aston Martin and the constructors, as you can see. Uh, if Stroll was like up there with Alonso, they could have fought for P2 in the cha- uh, constructor championship. So it's unfortunate for Aston Martin there. Alpine drivers in P11, P12, Ocon had of Gasly. This is an interesting one because Gasly, as we'll see in head to later on, was a uh, considerably better driver over the entire season. Good, at least, good a podium as well. Uh, when the Alpine brought out the mid season upgrades and actually went from back markers to a very solid midfield car that was at points just even topping sessions. It was it was insane how quick Alpine has become towards the end of the season. But obviously if if they would bring that car to start of the season they could have finished much higher. But at point they're just in the, having another mid season as you would expect with Alpine. Ocon this time ahead of Gasly, as mentioned earlier. 88 points for Ocon, 75 points for Gasly with a podium as well. P13 for Yuki Tsunoda, which is honestly very impressive from Tsunoda, especially the early parts of the season. When you will look at the individual parts, 
he was demolishing Ricardo at the start of the season, where the car was very, very good. Uh, Racing Bulls car started off very strong, and just like Mercedes got just slower and slower as the season progressed, they couldn't keep up with the development, unfortunately. And that man, when Ricardo actually started outperforming Sonoda, uh, Ricardo just couldn't score any points as the car was just not capable of points finishes most of the time. So the gap in points looks awful for Ricardo, but yeah, that's mostly due to the, the car development of that team. I'm not saying Ricardo had a good season whatsoever. 14, 14th place for Alex Albon with 19 points and a podium. Yeah, podium in Saudi Arabia. Very good race from, not great, just amazing race from Albon there, as he obviously uh, profited from some chaos in that race as well. Uh, generally, a good season from Albon. Sargent was closer during this time, uh, and especially in points. It's like three points separating them. It was just one crazy result away from Sargent actually outscoring Albon. And yeah, generally in qualifying, Albon still having the edge on Sargent by a considerable margin. In the races, it was much, much closer, as we'll see in the heads. Uh, but yeah, Albon still being the better driver at Williams, unfortunately, the Williams car just wasn't very strong over the entire season. Haas of Nico Hulkenberg, P15, 19 points and a podium. Yes, a podium for Nico Hulkenberg. Uh, I couldn't believe it. I couldn't have believed it when it actually happened. Uh, spoilers are, spoiler alert, it was in Singapore, which was the crazy race that Hamilton won. And Hulkenberg came to get P3 and has it. Got the only double points finish in like several years, which is an insane race that Hulkenberg could manage to get a podium, which obviously he, he profited from some chaos, but also he started like quite, quite high up. I think he qualified like top six, so he merited that. And finally, the wait is over. The record is still his, most, most, uh, most restarts without a podium, and he still holds the record for most restarts without a race. A win, but it was an incredible season for Hulkenberg, and he absolutely destroyed Magnussen in that awful has that couldn't do much throughout the entire season. It was just a couple of random points finishes, just like last year, pretty much. Just the even though the points looked better for Has than mostly due to the actual luck they had, unlike last season where when when the Has drivers were actually driving good, they didn't have that luck that would boost them higher up. Uh, we would uh, imagine like uh, Austria sprint, for example, or Hulkenberg was uh, well P2 for most of the sprint, but then just the battle lag and strategy. I mean, he climbed up all the way up to P6, but still, uh, yeah, he, he, the rain stopped kind of and the track dried up, so that, mean, that meant that the Haas race pace kicked in in that season. Here, it was a Singapore Grand Prix, which was wet throughout the entire time. So the wet, the drivers that are good in the rain, uh, Hulkenberg is one of them, as, as well as Lewis Hamilton, who obviously won the race. Uh, those could profit from the, their wet weather abilities. Logan Sargent, P16, uh, with 16 points, a much, much stronger season from Sargent compared to the last season, but still was lacking behind Albon. Especially in qualifying, it was it was not a wide wash like last year, but it was pretty pretty one sided for in Albon's favor this time. But the race head to heads is much much closer, and the points show that Sargent is able to uh, fight Albon on his day. But it needs to be just more consistent in that regard. P seventeen for Daniel Ricciardo with fifteen points. This looks horrible in terms of points, but as I said earlier, Ricardo starting to actually drive well and match snow that even beat him at times uh, as the car became much bad, much, much not like it became bad, but it became worse compared to the rest because other teams were just bringing more upgrades and the Racing Bulls car couldn't match to keep up with the de development. And yeah, Ricardo unfortunately only P17 not the greatest thing you want, uh, not the greatest season you want when you want that Red Bull seat. In this case, P18 for Valtteri Bottas, five points. Destroyed Joe, 
had a, the slowest car on the grid. Nothing he could nothing he could do there. Pretty much, even though the the car it's it, it was the slowest car the, throughout the entire season because Haas brought some upgrade in the middle, which made them uh, like halfway between Sauber and the eighth fastest team on paper, which just meant that over the entire season, through a, like at least on paper, the Haas was a better car than Sauber, but both were pretty much back markers throughout the entire season. It was very difficult to score points. As you can see, Gwenya Jogo scored zero. Magnussen scored one. That was the odd ways in, uh, in Singapore, where it was just absolute chaos. So yeah, this is the this is the drive championship in numbers. Here's the graph how it evolved throughout, uh, throughout the entire season. I'm going to comment on every single one as I did that pretty much probably in every recap that I did throughout the season. So you can take a look at it. Uh, see what, who who's done well when and when the when the cars were good and so on. Just you can see that Alpine upgrading Azerbaijan would just bring them so many points. And Racing Bulls car got most points up until Miami and then just couldn't do much pretty much. So yeah, this the this the car championship. Uh, Max Verstappen won the driver championship in the Brazilian Grand Prix and. And yeah, that's, that's about it for this one. Constructors Championship. Uh, this was more interesting in my opinion. Uh, Red Bull won by like about 150 points. It's it's not a it's not a great look for for excitement, uh, but that that gap wasn't as big. It was just which just other teams couldn't maintain maintain that consistency throughout the entire season, especially at the end. It was just Red Bull winning every single race, and the gap just became larger and larger. It was actually McLaren who were the closest challenger to Red Bull um, during the second third of the race, uh, of the season. But then overall, Ferrari just became the second fastest car. McLaren started having a bad weekend after bad weekend, and it just dropped off. So Red Bull could just drive away with the constructors, which they also won after the Brazilian Grand Prix. Uh, basically, the, after the Brazilian Grand Prix race, uh, both championships were won at the same time. So big celebrations for Red Bull there. I mean, victories overall for Red Bull, so not fair dominant in that regard, but 23 podiums, that's very good. Tall pole positions. Looks like the Red Bull was actually very good. Uh, qualifying car is this scenario having more pole positions than a race win, which is not something you would expect from Red Bull. 14 fastest laps, although that shows just that uh, Red Bull may have just been unlucky at times as well. Ferrari in P2, 409 points, 5 victories, tied with McLaren for the second most, 15 podiums, that's the second most, five, uh, 6 pole positions, that's second most, 5 fastest laps, that's second most as well. Ferrari had a had a good season. They had a good car, just not as good as Red Bull. And honestly, there's nothing much you can do there. Um, very very bad luck for for the drivers on some occasions, especially Carlos Sainz, who, who was very unlucky for the entire season. I I got to admit that. McLaren P3, 433 points, five victories, 12 podiums, five pulls, and two fastest laps. McLaren had a that we are season where they're sometimes just extremely good fighting for victories or like race uh, race after race and then just dropping off being like one second of the pace it was it was weird their, their car was very inconsistent for an entire season and even though it was their their highs were very high they were they were pretty much fastest car and in, in a couple of races it was just they couldn't maintain that speed over uh over different circuits and especially uh High speed, not, not not high speed corners, but high speed circuits like Monza, Azerbaijan. Those were very bad for McLaren, considering the the drag their car had for some reason throughout uh, throughout this throughout the season. Pretty much, yeah. Aston Martin P four, three hundred ninety seven points. They actually managed to beat Mercedes despite Lance Stroll uh, not being uh, the most capable driver out there. Three victories, that's very good. Most most of them, well, all of them came from Alonso. Eight, ten, po ten podiums, most of them came from Alonso. Three poles, Alonso, Alonso, and fastest laps as well. 
this team was pretty much carried by Alonso. And uh, if if they had two capable drivers, they could have easily fought for repeating the championship. That car was very strong for uh, the entire season. Had very few moments where the car wasn't competitive uh, enough to be in the top ten. And just just a very good season for Aston. Just not having two capable drivers who would bring out the points to the team. So yeah, that's unfortunate. Mercedes, even more unfortunate. Their, their car was very good at the start of the season. They were actually leading the constructors. I think they're the only team, apart from Red Bull, who were able to lead the constructors. Uh, 367 points now in P5. A big drop of in performance uh, in the middle of the season and towards the end. Mercedes' car was just just never the second fastest car, so they were never able to outscore their rivals. Obviously, the, the fight with Aston Martin was was pretty fierce. It was just relatively close, but at, at the end of the first, last few races, Aston Martin just ma- managed to maintain their lead. Two victories for Mercedes, uh, one for each driver, and nine podiums, most of them from George Russell, uh, as mentioned earlier, from the start of the season where the Mercedes car was frying. Alpine P6, 163 points on the podium. Yeah, what could have been if Alpine actually brought their upgrades at actually the start of the season? You would never know. Probably would have still finished P6, but we'll, we'll be very much, much, much closer uh, to Mercedes and Aston Martin in, in, this, in this scenario. But they didn't. Alpine at the start of the season was pretty much a back marker with some odd occasion points, finishes. The racing bulls car was actually much much stronger, but then helping brought the upgrades and could leapfrog them in the constructors. 68 points for racing bulls, just shy of the nice number. Unfortunately for for them, they just they just couldn't manage to develop that car for the for the season, which is very sad. And especially from that start that Yuki had, Yuki managed to hold on to that top ten or slash top eight in the drivers championship for so long. But then just no points finishes after no points finishes managed to drop him all the way down to P13, I think it was. P8 for Williams, 35 points. Looks all right in terms of points. The, they're one one position behind uh, in the structures compared to last year. But with a podium, that's, uh, that's a positive. Obviously, it was not like super on merit on speed in terms of that, but Still, podium is a podium, um, and yeah, Williams could be happy with this season, even though they had they, they, they could be happy from that perspective that they didn't drop off in performance, they just stayed where they were. But unfortunately, Racing Bulls car compared to last season was just starting off very strong, and they could actually manage to get points in that in this scenario. P9, perhaps, uh, I, I, I don't know, where it's just awful team. Well, no, I'm not an awful team, but awful management of the team, especially from Gene Haas. Just, just that the, the team was pretty much like destined to get top, well, bottom two in the championship. Just, there's no, no hope there, no, no excitement there. Just a random podium from Singapore that was mostly due to the driver's ability, and their double points finish pretty much saved them that day. From P10 and the constructors, because Sauber was leading them for the most of the season. P10 for Sauber, five points, all of them from Valtteri Bottas. Yep, it's the slowest car for an entire season, even though we're leading Haas up until Singapore. They just didn't have the pace to bring 15 points home to jump Haas, all 16 points in the snare, because they would be losing on count back. A very, very sad season for the Sauber team. Was, which obviously rebranded, and I don't care about the rebrand. I'm gonna call this Tauber. I don't care. The evolution here it is. You can see up until if, if, what is was it? It was the Dutch Grand Prix where McLaren was actually very very close to Red Bull. And actually, it was wrong. Mercedes wasn't the only team who led the constructors. It was actually Ferrari as well after after Australia. Uh so yeah, it was it was a very close fight. Especially when you look at the Canada Spain uh, section where the cl- five teams were very, very close to each other. It, there was very exciting times, but then as the season when Red Bull just cruised into the constructors, Ferrari with McLaren, yeah, 
McLaren was good, then Ferrari was good, then McLaren was good, then Ferrari was very good, and that just how the season ended. The fight between Aston and Mercedes was more interesting, while well, in the end, the, those two teams just were destined to finish, well, fourth and fifth, in whatever order. Uh, Alpine. Apart from Azerbaijan, a uh, back Parker team, pretty much, Not, nothing to say there. But Singapore, USA, Mexico, Brazil, Las Vegas, Qatar, Abu Dhabi. All of those were points finishes. They maintained a, a seven, seven race weekend points finish streak, which is impressive for a team that was, well, they were second last at the start of the season, couldn't score any points. And now, well, well, well now it's just end of the season, but Alpine, it, they're the definition of a myth. That like just that that team has that looks like they have no ambition of actually being in the fight with top teams. As this season actually looks much much worse than in, than here, for example, they could even be slower than Haas, which is which is scary. Thought that you can actually jump behind Haas in the <laughs> in the speed chart. Well, Haas is just not developing their cars. How do you manage that? I guess you need to be French enough for that. I don't know. Um, yeah, Alpha, uh, Alpha Tauri. I don't know why it's called Alpha Tauri. My apologies. It should be Racing Bulls or or whatever the team name is. I am not going to pronounce uh, the, just all oh, the bl- the blue blue bull or whatever the the car that looks like a Red Bull can with a white stripe. Which is, yeah, they had a very good start of season. Uh, but then just no points to pretty much throughout the, the bottom end. Williams um, they actually had quite a lot of points finishes. Actually, Sargent finished in the points uh, several more times than, well, not sort of more, but uh, Sargent had more points finishes than Alban. I'm pretty sure Alban only had two. One of them was a podium, obviously. And Sargent was the driver who was actually scoring points, so if you would t- only take the second half of the season, Sargent would outscore Albon by a, a huge margin, which is interesting to say, honestly. Um, yeah, Haas with the Singapore, you can see that they were pretty much well, at, at no points, and Haas just well, like, rocketed ahead of Sauber after the Singapore Grand Prix, and they just stay there. Yeah, that was the constructors. Um, here we get to the head to heads. Starting with Sauber team, last in the constructors, Valtteri Bottas scoring the five points on the team. I'm pretty much to say there it was Valtteri Bottas was the better driver. With more DN- DNFs as well, the head to heads are just all, all in favor of Bottas, and that's really, uh, good for Joe's future in this case. So we get to the Haas, 19 points for Alpine, but the Magnussen one, not a great lead for Magnussen. Uh, Especially Hulkenberg getting the maiden podium and maiden podium for the Haas team as well. Uh, it's, diff- it's important to mention that Haas never scored a podium, and neither did Hulkenberg. So in this case, uh, them scoring a podium, podium together would be amazing. Uh, all the head-to-heads in Hulkenberg's favor as well. With Magnussen having one more DNF, but that's not really the, not really, not, not really that would matter here as there was DNFs were mostly just from bottom five uh, before before uh, the DNF. So, so yeah, that's it. This for has Williams and PA and the structures. Points, very, very similar. Podium, we have all in favor. The head-to-heads, especially in the races, were actually not, like, extremely close, but they're much, much closer than last season, for example. Uh, yeah, average race position, when you look at that, uh, these are, by the way, combined race plus sprints, so if you confuse why is it more than 24 combined, it's because of that. Um, yeah, average race position in that in this scenario is just 0.9 difference. It's very good for Sargent. It was actually a tip, improvement, like a big improvement. Quality, not as much, but Sargent could qualify Alvin six times. That's six times more than last season. Um, and yeah, average quality position is is in favor of Alvin by a, by a big margin as well, but it's not like that horrible for Sargent. DNFs in, uh, yeah, Alvin had more, more, many more DNFs, but most of them were from no no points uh, no points positions anyway. So 
doesn't matter in this, in this case. This is the racing wheel scene. I changed the change it to blue so they match the car a bit more. Uh, you can see now that I'm scoring many more points than Ricardo in this case, but those head to heads are very close. Race head to head is in favor of Sonata just by a bit, but the race position is just almost equal. Qualifying is actually in Ricardo's favor, and the average qualifying position is pretty much the same. And two DNS for both of them. So, yeah, if if they were like consistent for the entire season, they were pretty much finished next to each other. But in this case, you know, that was good when the car was good and could manage to get way more points for the team. This is the Alpine head to head. As you can see, uh, Gasly losing on points, but winning pretty much everywhere else. Just uh, average quality position is pretty much equal. DNFs for, for Gasly. All you have to have for Gasly better. Average race position is better for Gasly. Race head to head is much better for Gasly. He could manage a podium as well. But Ocon got more points. Yeah, it's just kind of a repeat of what happened with Fernando that time, where Ocon could outscore Fernando, but it was clear to everyone that Fernando was the better driver. Not like by much, but was the better driver throughout the entire season. They were teammates. And uh, this in this case, it's very similar. Pierre Gasly was the better driver, but but less points. It just uh, simulation, yeah. This is Mercedes team, E5 in the constructors, and pretty much the same points, the victories uh, for both of them. Clean podiums to two of Hamilton. Uh, for Russell, that's that's good for Russell. Obviously, it's the similar scenario to, uh, to the racing balls, but here, Hamilton just could bring that gap down and actually could overtake Russell after the final race of the season and outscore Russell by one point. Two, oh, sorry, one fast slot for Hamilton there. Race head to heads equal, pretty much average race position equal as well. Quality head to head is a bit in favor of Hamilton, but actually Russell having the better average qualifying position. Uh, yeah, I would say they were ext extremely equal duo, just not equal, like not equal at the same time. They're like. Yes. Either George Russell is the better driver at the moment, or Lewis Hamilton. Just they're switching around the, throughout the season. DNFs in favor of Russell. Well, not in favor of Russell. Uh, Russell just had more DNFs. I don't know. What I'm saying just yeah, both drivers unlucky. Russell a bit more, but that wouldn't like matter too much. Probably Russell would finish ahead in points, but as you can see, the the season was extremely close, and he could pretty much. Say like the, the both drivers had low luck in their own own regard so it's like they're ex extremely equal probably the second most equal uh, driver pairing out there as we'll get to the most equal later Fernando Alonso the strong stroll I mean this 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 looks just looks horrible for stroll uh these are tads uh stroll only can manage to match Fernando in the NFs which <laughs> which is a funny stat yeah the NFs free for both of them. Uh, just for Alonso having much better qualifying position, head to head, race position, had, race head to head, more fastest line, more pole positions, more podiums, more victories. Well, all the victories of the, of the team and more points. Uh, just yeah, pretty much last season, but Aston Martin is a better car relative to the, to the, to the entire field throughout the entire season. So getting to McLaren, uh, this is uh, this is in my opinion the closest trial pairing of the simulation. And it was ever since the first six races. Their head to heads were so close, they were pretty much equal throughout the entire simulation. And I was, I was actually like, how, how was it happening? How did it end up with the, uh, <laughs> this, the head to heads are so, so close? I actually don't know how, how this happened. Like, it was maintained for an entire season. There was, just, there was just no, like, no, like, arranging this way that would actually make. One driver having more luck and there were more, well, better head to head. It was just they're so equal. The points, yeah, 25 more for Lando, but uh, not not like the significant, more, more significant for margin out there. Uh, just a one more victory for Lando here. Podiums were in favor of Lando, but Oscar wasn't having, well, no podiums. He was like five, just great number still. More pole positions for Oscar Piaget than Lando Norris. Is an interesting stat. Oscar Piastri 
having well having more of those moments. Battles love were equal for them. Race head to heads pretty much equal as well. Average rate position as well. Average qualifying head to head literally the same number and average qualifying position just by a tiny bit in favor of uh, Oscar Piastri. So yeah. the closest driver head to head that I've ever seen in any of my simulations and yeah, probably the most likely to happen as well in real life as Oscar Piastri is going to his second season and well, is looking to match Lando uh, this time because it's not a rookie anymore. So hopefully that this, this thing actually happen. I would be very glad if McLaren were to win five races in this, in this season. Uh, so yeah, Ferrari, yeah, uh, most of them are in favor of Leclerc, apart from the DNFs, which obviously Carlos had more DNFs and more bad luck, which is a weird, weird thing to say. You would expect Charles to be more a lucky driver, but the, the, not like Charles had no bad luck. He had his fair share of bad luck. Just as Carlos had a bit more, and yeah, it sometimes happens like that. Um, four podiums for Carlos Sainz, but pretty much every single uh, every single stat is just in favor of Leclerc. Uh, Leclerc just had a very good season, and yeah, despite Carlos having a good season as well, he just not have that consistency, I guess. Uh, very good driver pairing overall. Just just one generational talent against the extremely good driver that's just yeah th those are the margins that you would get normal max Verstappen destroying sergio perez pretty much the same thing as in uh as, uh <coughs> sorry sorry my throat is still not fully healthy uh max Verstappen just destroying sergio perez just like in aston's case for stroll just perez not managing to be there most of the time but 236 points, uh, very strong at the end of the season, actually, for Perez. Uh, got a victory in Baku, which is kind of iconic for Perez to uh, get a good race, the one good race in the entire season where he beats Max, and it's in, it's in a street track like Baku. Seven podiums for Perez is, yeah, not good compared to Max's number. Zero positions for Perez this time, and uh, zero fastest lap as, as well. Race head to head, much in favor of Max, as well as the uh, all the other all the other stats, with DNFs being equal for both of them. Um, yeah, that's it for the head to head. So I'm pretty sure this is the end of the video. So if you enjoyed this video, make sure to subscribe, like the video, and comment down below what you want to see for my content moving forward. Tomorrow, uh, barring Grand Prix predictions, you can come out, and in two days, a liver ranking as we move to the first race of the season. So, yeah, as always, see ya.